Good evening and welcome to Burnside Unbound. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. Uh, and I would also like to pay my, res my respects to elders past and present. Tonight, we are joined by reality TV star, podcaster, writer, and toy collector, Trent Cuccarelli. Hey, Trent. G'day, how's it going? Very well, thank you. How are you? Oh, fantastic. Apart from being in, in isolation at the moment. Uh, so, but other than that, pretty good. What a fun room to be uh, isolated in though, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Uh, yeah, no, you can spend a lot of time in this room, can kind of just get lost, lost with all the toys, just sort of yeah. find myself, you know, staring around at the, the different things. So, no, pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, well, look, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, I know you would have liked to be here in person, but as you said, you're isolating due to the to the COVIDs. Um, so thank you for joining us and thank you for keeping your germs to yourself. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> Pleasure. Um, and thank you for everybody uh, for registering for the webinar. Um, uh, you know, we understand that it would be nice to be here, but thank you for those of you who did register uh, for the webinar. Um, and if you've got any questions uh, for Trent uh, throughout the webinar, please enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom uh, where, and we'll do our best to get to them throughout the webinar. So um, firstly, I think we need to address the elephant in the room. How do you pronounce it? How do you pronounce the name of those little building bricks? <laughs> what do you call them? The, uh, the, the Lego bricks. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, look, this is, this is a lot of controversy around the pronunciation. And I think SA cops a bit of a, a rap of being obtuse, perhaps, with the, the pronunciation. We have to say it differently to everyone else in the world. They have to say it like Le Lego. Um, I, look, I think, the, I think the correct pronunciation is somewhere in the middle. Lego. I think if you were to, if you were to do it. But... Um, why the whole world does Lego and we sort of do the Lego. It's just one of those mysteries. <laughs> Somebody um, mentioned to me the other day that they thought it might be because uh, we were the only state that uh, was freely settled and, you know, we're just a bit posh. Yeah, could have been. <laughs> yep. Um, so what, what made you want to audition for Lego Masters? What, what sort of sparked your interest there? Yeah, it was, it's a really interesting journey. So as you can see, I'm, I'm passionate about toys and toy collecting. And about four years ago, we started up a podcast where we would talk about toys and interview people within the industry and, and, and just sort of keep our finger on the pulse of, of the toy world. And of course, Lego Masters Season 1 came and it came out of the blue for me. Had really no idea it was, it was on um, and tuned in because, uh, you know, it's a toy that I grew up with and a toy that I collect today. And I loved it. It was just a fun show, amazed by what those guys could build. And we had one of our um, listeners tune in and say, hey, um, my mate, Billsy, he and I actually auditioned together to go on Lego Masters. But I had to pull out the last minute. He got paired up with Kale. But he'd love to come on your podcast and talk about his experience. So we managed to get Billsy to come on. Um, and did the interview. And, and of course, I had this sort of question, I had this question for him about, oh, look, how much do you think they manipulated what you were like? Or how much of it was just you? And he goes, look, mate, that was 100% me. Really well edited. I was so happy with it. Like, just a really good show the way they put it together. And I thought, okay, that's, that's allayed one of my big concerns about reality TV in that otherwise they could, you know, make it make you look in a, in a certain way if they wanted to. Um, and at the end, and Billsy had an interesting one because he got paired up with Kale and the two didn't necessarily see eye to eye on a lot of things, but he still had a wonderful experience. And at the end, he said, look, if you ever get a chance, audition for it. Audition because I had the most wonderful time. It was just a once in a lifetime experience. And I thought, well, what, what have I got to lose from giving it a go? I love, I love Lego. Um, I love talking about toys and passionate about that sort of thing. So just give it a crack. And that's that's uh, where where I ended up. Wow, um, and so when you did audition, what what was the process like from you know submitting an application to getting to TV? Yeah, it's it's much like going for a job. So there's a number of different uh, stages that you need to go through: uh, written application, 
little videos of, of you presenting yourself and then you know, Skype interviews with production staff and, and eventually it'll culminate in a, a kind of like a mini build day. Um, and for me, I, I, I auditioned as a solo entrant. So that meant I, I hadn't picked out a partner. I was just gonna go for it. And if I was successful, I'd get paired up. And I'm, my, my background with Lego, just to put this in context, right? Cause I think this is quite important. I love collecting Lego sets and I love building Lego sets, but I'm not a creative builder. So I'd done no creative builds. And we, we're going through the audition process and this, and one of the, the interviewers says, hey, cool, you're in for an interview. Uh, you, you're in, it's in two days. And I'm like, oh, great, fantastic. And he goes, um, do, you, do you do any, you got, you got any Lego you can show us on the, on the interview? And I'm like, yeah, I've, I've got, oh man, I've got, look at this collection. I've got tons of Lego. And he's like, cool, that's great. Just, just bring some, something along. I'll put it all in an email, send it through and, and we're all good for two days. So I get this email and, and I'm like, cool. I, you know, I've got so much Lego, I could show him all sorts of things. And I read it and it says, please bring along any MOCs, any mocks. And I'm like, I, I know what mock is in toy collecting terms. You know, it means mint on card, but I don't know what it is in Lego terms. So I Googled, you know, what is mock in Lego? And it stood for my own creation. I'm like, well, I don't have any, I don't have any my own creations. I've got all these sets I've built, but I've got nothing I've built myself. So I, was, I started to panic because it was like two days and I've got to present these creations. So I went out to one of the de department stores and just bought like a set of just bricks. Yep. And so I'm sitting at home and I'm going, what do I, what do I build with these bricks so I can present it to this, this interview? Because if, if I've got nothing to show, then there's no way I'm getting on the show. So bright colors, Lego stuff, and I'm just like Sesame Street, done, cool. So I built like a, you know, Cookie Monster, Oscar the Grouch in his trash can, a big bird. And, and, and that was enough to kind of get me through. But there was always this kind of undertone. And I was quite open and upfront saying, look, I, I love Lego, but I haven't done a lot of creative building. And I got a call one day from one of the story producers saying, look, this is a reality TV show where the whole purpose is to do creative building. You know, do you think you can do that? And I said, look, I, I reckon... Given, given the opportunity, given access to the brick pit, I can do it, but you know, I just don't have a portfolio behind me. But what I was secretly hoping for in this equation was they would just pair me up with someone who was a, a brilliant builder. Um, you know, had a lot of experience and they'd take the lead and I could sort of be the, you know, the brick monkey and do the, the legwork. And I get, it was a Friday before we flew out on the Tuesday and I get an email from production saying, you're paired up with, a guy called Josh Taylor. And I said, cool, we'll, we'll organize a meeting before we fly out so we can, you know, have a bit of a chat and, and it's all good. And I, and I thought, ah, oh, because I remembered back to the interviews and there was only another guy who'd interviewed by himself and I'd, I'd talked to him and he was a very accomplished builder. He showed me all his builds and I'm like, oh, that, that must be Josh because he's the only other single applicant. So I must be good. Cool. Anyway, doorbell goes, go to my front door, and there's this young guy with blonde hair, looked nothing like the guy I had in my mind who was, who was the really good builder. I'm like, you know, come on in. He's like, oh, wow, you got a lot of Lego here. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And he's like, oh, I used to play with Lego when I was a kid. Uh, you know, I, I don't really do any Lego at the moment, but, uh, you know, I loved it when I was growing up. And uh, I really wanted to audition for The Amazing Race, but that closed a week ago. So I thought, I'll give this a go. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. Um, you've just, I've just been paired up with someone who's got even less creative building experience than myself. So that was the seed. And if you go back and you kind of watch episode one and you see what we produce, they don't show a lot of what we did. And that's very quick because it was of a very subpar quality, but we, <laughs> we took a little while to get into our rhythm. Um, but thankfully, thankfully we did find a groove and, and the rest is history. Wow. Um, Wow, fantastic. It, it's funny. I'm, I'm looking at the question and answer over here. We have a few questions in here. One uh, from a guy named Josh Taylor. <laughs> I'd like to know who your favourite partner was. Oh, well, Josh, I, and I'll tell you this. This is great that he has tuned in. Josh was the best partner I think I could have had on the show. And the reason for that is if I, I think if I'd gone in with someone who was a, a really like a kale of season one, really proficient builder, I would have been quite comfortable in that role. Like I would have been quite happy just to, to help out and, and, and do, and, and having Josh being the, the master and having Josh as the, the Padawan um, 
really pushed me to take that leadership role. And what Josh was, so Josh might've not had a lot of experience, but I tell you what, he's the quickest learner I've ever met in my life. And he was able to do some of the most incredible things with technique and support. And even his, like the bull he built, the way he picked it up was nothing short of outstanding. And I think if we, I don't know, if we didn't have that chemistry, I don't think we would have got as far. I don't think I would have got as far because I probably would have been the weak link in, in another equation, potentially, if I'd taken that, you know, I'll just let the other person kind of do most of it. So I was eternally grateful that I did get paired up with Josh. Uh, Josh uh, has responded with, woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> um, going back, you did mention Kale. Um, so uh, Megan has asked, did you meet Kale, the villain of season one? And... Um, if you did, was Kale happy being portrayed as the villain? Uh, it's a really good question. I didn't <clears throat> meet Kale. Well, I, in fact, we, we didn't get a chance to meet many of the season one contestants. Jordy obviously had a role in season two. So he was on set and we got to chat with him a little bit. Funnily enough, um, one after filming for about a week, I was in the airport flying back to Adelaide for a weekend. And I'm in the, I'm in the airport and, and Jimmy and Maddie are there. And I'm like, oh, this is too good an opportunity. I'm going to go up and, and just say, hey. So, but at this point of filming it, we'd signed confidentiality agreements. We couldn't say to anyone that we're on the show. So I went up, said, hey, to Jimmy and Maddie and got a selfie with them. Cause I thought this will be cool later on when I can go back and say, hey, remember me from the selfie, you know, that, that's me from season two. So I thought that'll be, that'll be a cool little thing to chat to Jimmy and Maddie about. Um, but as, as Maddie was about to say, see, her, she goes, oh, did you audition for, for season two? And I said, oh, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, I did audition. And she goes, oh, what a shame. They're filming at the moment, but maybe you have better luck for season three. So that was, that was really cool. So, you know, because she had a bit of inside information about what was going on and, and um, you know, knew that they'd started. If I hadn't heard, then you know, it wouldn't be on. But I kept, kept my lips sealed. Um, but to go back to Kale, I did meet, I did see Kale at a, a convention called Brickvention, which is a, a massively impressive convention that just happened to coincide on the last day of filming in Melbourne. Um, so I did get to that. I didn't actually go up and, and chat to him, but I saw him there. Um, <clears throat> I think Kale would, I don't know. It, it's one of these hard ones that I don't know if Lego masters were looking to have a villain. Like I, I don't feel that in season two, there really was a villain character. So I, I would say that I guess, you know, Kale being Kale was being himself and, 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 you know, the editing, they, they can do a bit with that, but at the end of the day, I guess if you say those things, that is, that is you to some, to some extent. And like I said, I think Lego masters is not looking for that angle. It's a show about being creative and showing creative builds and, and it's more about that element than I guess being about controversy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually really appreciated that in, in watching um, the, the show. Like, you know, it's, it's just a, a show to make you feel good. I like that a lot. Yeah. Um, so can you share with us uh, any of your favorite memories from the show? Oh, look, I'd, I'd have to, a lot of, <coughs> a lot of good memories, excuse me. Um, but the highlight, and hopefully it comes across on the actual episode, but the highlight for me was the star Wars episode being a massive. Yeah. A bit. yeah, yeah. Look, I could, kind of tell that you were into Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. I mean, being a massive Star Wars fan, and it's, it's funny because uh, Star Wars Lego, a lot, I meet a lot of people and they're like, oh, I've, I've got my old Star Wars Lego back from the 80s. And, and I, I was confused for a while because Star Wars Lego didn't actually debut until 1999. But what they're talking about is what, they, what we call vintage space Lego, right? So, you know, it's like the Benny. Benny, I think you've got a book behind you with the, the blue spaceman. That's what they're talking about, classic space Lego, right? So, you know, that, that, that was a big line, big theme for Lego in the 80s, um, massively popular. Um, but Star Wars Lego didn't come out till 1999. So 1999, I would have been, uh, you, you know, 18, 18 or so. And that was the one missing link as a child was Star Wars Lego. So, you know, you do your best. It's Lego. It's a building block. You can kind of create your own ships and, and replicate things. So, you know, I remember getting a, a black knight's helmet and putting it on a, a head and making that Darth Vader, you know, it's close enough. Um, but 
Star Wars Lego was just the melding of one of my favorite uh, properties and one of my favorite toys and bringing them together. And that really, that was the impetus to kind of get me back interested in Lego as an adult. Um, yeah. Because I kind of, you know, I've, I'd lost interest in it, enjoyed it as a kid, but lost interest in it. So Star Wars and Lego mean a lot to me personally. And, and I'll caveat, I'll just give a, <clears throat> a very quick summary that I had no expectation that we would even be allowed to build anything in the, in the Star Wars universe. Because deep down, I knew that Lego Masters Australia, which in, in the grand scheme of things is a relatively small player in the, the world of negotiating big deals, had to go up and negotiate that contract with Disney because Disney now owns Star Wars. So one of the biggest corporations in the world had to get the blessing of both Star Wars and Lego for that to work. And, and I just didn't think this kind of deal could be done. So when we found out that we were going to be building in the Star Wars universe, those stormtroopers came out, I was just on another level. Like it was just excitement uh, and, and I was caught a few times talking to Hamish saying, I think this is the best day of my life. And I had to catch myself and say, no, actually, when I got married, that was, that was pretty good too. And yeah, birth of my kids, that, that was, but the, maybe number four. Like, so it was, it was just a wonderful experience. So many happy memories. And because it wasn't an elimination, you could just go out and have fun. Um, and I remember making like, the comment I got from Brickman on that episode was, I'd incorporated too many elements into the starship. Like it, it was, it wasn't scrappy enough for the rebels. And my only response to that was to say, well, you know, as an accountant, now I'm going to be the laughing stock of the accounting community because I've done the one sin and gone over budget. Um, <laughs> so, um, and I had these memories of like, you know, um, the targeting computers on and, and instead of stay on target, it's stay on budget. So um, that's, uh, that's, that's sort of like, and I think you just have to laugh at these these kind of situations because yeah. I, I found that you know quite amusing. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple of people asking, uh, what was your favourite build during the ser the series? Yeah, it's a really good question. We, we I was proud of a lot of the builds that Josh and I did. Um, the 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 kind of the cat one was an interesting one because it was a real rags to riches story, and I think because we kind of came from nothing, that was a really good, and it kind of got us in the groove of the character building, those bigger comic based characters that had the funny expressions. But what sort of crystallized that style for us was the bull rider and the bull. And yeah. the, the uh, so, and, and that was, that was the 3d art challenge that that bull rider and bull was coming out of the canvas by a good meter. Josh just used clutch power to hold that whole bull on. And I reckon if he'd gone, I think Brick, according to Brickman, if he'd gone out like, you know, a few more bricks, it would have just collapsed. Um, but, you know, Josh, Josh um, trusted in his instincts and went for it. But what, what I loved, I think it came out really well. It was our most kind of complete and polished build. But it, it showed a really good use of the teamwork. So, you know, Josh focused on the bull. I focused on the rider. We put them together. Josh helped me with the, well, when I say helped, did all the technical mechanics to hold that bull rider onto the bull and it was just a perfect blend of of our two styles coming together in the one build and um, we both contributed to it and, and i think it turned out really really cool yeah fantastic um something like just from watching the the series that that i sort of went i wonder why they did that did they tell you to like MacGyver under the roller door as it's going up or did someone just do that one day and then it was a competition to get you? <laughs> well, okay. So when you're, you know, standing behind that roller door and you, you can be standing there for quite a while, yeah. right? Because there might be some things they've got to get going and, and, you know, as contestants, well, we're, we're, we're cheap, right? So we, we come on, we can be waiting there for half an hour before we have to go on. But, but so you can be waiting there for a while. Um, but there's, a, there's an excitement that comes with that. Like you've been waiting, you're ready to get, you know, what's the next challenge? What's in that? And, and, and you do have, there are production people that are like, you know, get, get in there. Come on, get, get, in, get in, get under the door, you know, get excited. So um, it was a bit of a combination of the two, but I think for the finale, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, the, it was basically only open a crack when uh, Alex got under there. I don't know. That was, that was the, some, some mean MacGyver skills to, to get under it. And look, well, they won it. So 
first first in the door up hey first prize good on them <laughs> um we have a couple more questions over here um john wants to know were there any interesting incidents that were edited out of the show and if so what is that uh, something you're allowed to share well yeah technically I'm, I'm probably not meant to talk about things that didn't make the cut but i'm just i'm just trying to think i mean um what you know one thing obviously that 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 did make the cut that was probably the the most interesting incident was when summer fell ill and had to actually leave and and that was quite a concerning sort of episode because we were sort of you're building and you're focused on what you're doing but you're seeing these things sort of sort of happening um so that was that was something you know and and i guess what we saw um you know there was probably a lot of uh, you, we did see like a lot of people helping out or, or going over and, and kind of helping but that that to me was probably what I, what I would say is maybe those moments where I went and did something with another teammate. Like, so there was a moment in that Star Wars episode where, um, so if you cast your mind back to when we were filming, there was a TV show on the air called The Mandalorian, which was on Disney Plus. So we would go back, we'd go back to Andrew and Damien's place on a Wednesday night, we'd watch our Mandalorian. And I think we'd watched one the night before that that's, we, we went into the, to film Star Wars. So, and, and out of, you know, Josh is, he, he likes Star Wars, but he's not a massive fan, but, but Andrew was, was a huge fan. And there were moments where Andrew and I were embracing and, and, you know, just giddy and jumping around and, and, and having a good time. And, and production came up and said, look, Hey, uh, Trent, your partner is Josh, you know, just do, do your stuff with Josh and Andrew, you're, you know, you're with Damien. And I think that got cut because it's confusing for the audience that, yeah. I try to follow who the teams are and who are paired up. Um, so it, it, it's kind of, you know, they, they want it obviously to be a, a show that is, is clear and you can follow easily and, and work out, you know, cause you've got a lot of, you know, teams to meet and faces to remember and names to remember. So that, that sort of stuff, I probably just, just went. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, well, the questions are really coming in over here. I wasn't, was not expecting this many. What an engaged audience. Um, did did any uh, this is from sebastian did any job opportunities arise after lego masters or would yeah. that, uh if if covid19 had not happened yeah look it, it's it's interesting and and i um i was sort of i would planned to take a year off work and just kind of feel out what what had happened uh, what, what might happen if any opportunities might come up and and embrace them um and then covid hit as as so it hit covid hit we'd filmed it so it was all wrapped it was all in the can it just needed obviously to be edited kind of then COVID hits and then it airs and COVID's in there but I did get uh I did get a request from someone so I get this I get this we had Instagram profiles so people could contact us through Instagram and say hey and I got this one message saying one day from from a mum and she's like um uh, uh I want I want you to build my son a life-size Lego Deadpool. And I'm like, okay, cool. Like a life-size Lego Deadpool, that's going to cost maybe about $10,000. So I called my mate because I'm not experienced in this. Even as an accountant, I didn't quite know how to cost a Lego build of that scale. So I I contacted a mate who's a really, really good builder, head of one of the um, Lego user groups here in Adelaide, Steve Reddy. And I said, look, mate, can you help me design a, a life-size Lego Deadpool so I can quote um, to do the job? And, and, and if I win it, can you help me build it? And he's like, yeah, cool, that'll be great. Um, came back, I was, my, my instinct was right. I think came back at about 10 grand and went back. And I think that was just too much. <laughs> for Her son hadn't been that good. He didn't deserve a, a $10,000 <laughs> Lego Deadpool. So, but that, that was, there, there's a few things like that. We've got a few little projects in the works. Um, that we're working on uh, one with Josh, which is really, really exciting, which I can't reveal right now, but it's been more those little bits and pieces rather than any um, massive job opportunities. Yeah. Um, and this is one that we, we actually spoke about off air uh, before we started. Um, is Brickman really that emotional? That question's from Mark. Yeah. Good question, Mark. It's, it's, interesting because you're sitting there watching a reality tv show and you know how real is this this is a good question that emotion is 100 percent genuine um and i think where it comes from is 
Brickman, he's loved Lego his entire life. Like there's, I've seen photos of him as a, you know, 10 year old boy standing proudly with this, you know, Lego set. Um, he, he's lived and breathed Lego. He's, he's the only certified professional in Australia. I think in fact, in the Southern hemisphere. So he loves it. And his view on, you know, obviously he's the, the, the best person to judge the competition, but he would also have a side of him that would say, well, Lego is all about, creating something and when it's a creative pursuit we want to encourage people we want things to be about encourage them to do their best and and always you know commending them on what they've done and and you know improving sure but never never putting people down for it so he found it very very hard to actually eliminate people and and pass on those messages and even some proud moments where he was just so proud that you know damon andrew made it through to finals week and he choked up a little bit on that but that just goes to what a, what a nice man Brickman is. He's a wonderful, wonderful ambassador for Lego. And he was a wonderful mentor to have on the show. You know, we, we got to the finale from probably the scrappers of the competition. You know, we scrapped our way through and, and snuck through some eliminations to make it through and, and learn. But a lot of that learning, we put down to the feedback we got from Brickman and, and the way he guided and tutored us uh, sort of through that process. So just a just a wonderful guy. If you ever get the opportunity to catch him, he's always present, uh, hopefully in a, in a COVID-free world or when things open up again at the Lego conventions. If you get there, particularly if you get to Brickvention, he's always there. He's always happy for a chat. And I remember because, you know, like a lot of the interactions we had with Brickman are, are on set, right? So we weren't going out and having beers with him or having drinks with him or having lunch with him. It was, it was interactions on set. Um, but after we finished filming, we could actually catch up and and like i said we went to brickvention and caught up and he he came up to me at brickvention he's like trent trent oh i've got to show you what i've built i've got to show you this thing and he built like it was the most incredible thing in the room it was this giant like as high as the ceiling life-size mech from like mech warrior so basically a big robot and he goes look at this and he presses a little button on like a little remote control and the cockpit sort of opens up you know with a with a technic gear and inside he's built this character of like him as a tough guy smoking a cigar and <laughs> he was so excited because i'd be building all those larger than life characters yeah he was so excited to show me the character he'd built and share with me what he'd done and, and i tell you what it was absolutely fantastic better than all of my characters but that just goes to his passion for lego that it wasn't about um, you know, parading around like he's better than everyone else. It was about being passionate and excited and wanting to share what he knew other people would enjoy seeing um, and, and share that, that wonder. And that just, if you ever get a chance to go in a COVID free world to these Lego conventions, meet Brick Van, do it. Cause it's, it, he's such a lovely guy and he'll spend the time chatting to you and, and sharing his passion. Beautiful. Um, and uh, speaking on characters, like, you, the expressions on your characters' faces, I I just thought were so fantastic. Like the one of the um, characters on the on the ship, like with the sort of cross-eyed look. Uh, I was just like, how did he do that? Like, how do you learn to to sculpt faces with Lego? Well, yeah, I, I don't know. And and it was interesting. Like I said, I had no experience doing this, so it was all taught in a very short space of time and taught to myself. Um, I probably have to thank my my mum to some degree because she's a, an art teacher and always encouraged my art and I did a lot of art in high school and I, I loved painting and, and sculpting as much as, as I could do. So I think I, I must have drawn from my, my high school art experience and my mum's genetics to kind of maybe have that ability because a lot of people I met, because I just do it and go, you know, oh, I'm just doing it. It's, no, it's not that great. It's just what I'm doing. And I had a lot of people, you know, like, like Andrew, who's a very accomplished builder and Damien coming up and saying, well, what you're doing is actually really hard to do. And it's really amazing. And I'm like, well, it's not that great. Like it's, it's, it's not. So, um, but yeah, Brickman, I think um, was, was impressed. So that, that must've meant something. Um, but I think it's just, I think one of the tricks I probably cheated on a little bit was to make them cartoony. Cause if you try to make, it too realistic with Lego, it's quite hard. Um, so I think leaning into that cartoon style is a really big help. And I think I just kind of put my memory back to those old Looney Tunes cartoons where there's a lot of 
expression in the animation and just tried to draw on that a bit. So that's, that's, there's nothing more to it than that. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to take a swing at pronouncing this person's name and I'm sorry if I pronounce it incorrectly, but Vivan and Avin uh, would like to know uh, what was the hardest build uh, in your season? Yeah, um, I tell you what, the hanging brick challenge uh, was mind-boggling. And, and, and that came really early. And I think if you look back on season one, their hardest challenge, when you sort of look at all the episodes that went, was they did this one, and they did it fairly early on too, was this one called Half and Half. Yeah. And you look back on and we, we were just watching that. Before we started filming, we were watching the Half and Half going, my goodness. That, that's so hard and it's so early on in the, in the challenge. Um, for us, that same experience was the, the hanging brick. You walk into this room and there's a single Technic brick hanging from a, a piece of fishing wire and you've got to build from that. And, and so no one, no one in that room, you, know, you don't think to go, oh, today when I'm practicing my Lego at home, I'm going to suspend a brick from the ceiling. <laughs> fishing wire. So no one had done it. No one built that way. We made the mistake of building our like using the, the top of that as the bottom of the birdcage. So we, so Josh's arms were really sore by the end of it. Um, so we, we made some really, you know, like I said, we scrapped our way out of that episode. We made some, some mistakes. We had a lot of trouble with the engineering. Um, you know, and the episode where Summer was ill, for Iona to have to build from that brick by herself, you know, she did an amazing oh. job to, to get the pinata done. And like, it might've not been to the scale of the other builds, but just to be able to finish that was a testament to her um, building ability and, and her determination. Cause she could have easily given up and walked away. So that, that one. And I think, you know, we, I think we got kind of the, the prize a little bit out of the fact we scrapped our way out. I, I'm not, I'm not convinced ours was the best build on the day. I think if Timmy, Tim and Danny's fin hadn't fallen off the anglerfish, I think they would have won it. But people excelled themselves in that challenge. I think every build in that challenge is, is an amazing build. Um, and to do it from that hanging brick, yeah, just, just boggles the mind. And yeah. really, I, I mean, I, Josh has to take credit for all the engineering in our build because really all I did was build, well, I built the cats and, and the birds but I just attached them to his structure. So I didn't have to deal with the hanging bricks. I kind of, I kind of cheated on that one. Yeah. Um, now, what was my, speaking of, you know, hard and like, that sounds like a total nightmare to me. Um, but another nightmare that I think about is who cleaned up after after all of these challenges. Oh my goodness. I think they might've had a, they basically had a brick crew. Uh, so they, they were in a, a separate part of the, the filming studio. Um, they had to clean up the mess we made. And, and tell you what, when Geordie came in and looked at our brick pit, he goes, my goodness, you guys don't treat this with any of the level of respect we did. We were so neat. We just had like, there was Lego everywhere. They had to not only clean up the mess we made, but they had to then dismantle the, the models and put them all back together. And, and I can tell you what, after that, that tower challenge where Alex and Jackson just put brick on brick, they got a few dirty looks from those, from those brick crew. And, but I believe, I think, I, don't quote me on this because I might be wrong, but I think the production staff kind of, to some degree, um, rotated on and out of that team. They might have had a dedicated group that were like sorting and they were, that was their job. But I think it was sort of a bit of a rite of passage for some of the staff. Um, so yeah, a, a horrible job. And there was one, uh, speaking of things that didn't make the final cut, in the finale, it was with, uh, I don't know, two hours to go. I was in the brick pit and I was, I was there, there were these drawers where you'd, you'd pull them out and you'd get your Lego out right. And, and people were notorious for not closing the drawers. So someone's left the drawer open at about my chest height. And the, the problem, this is an engineering problem for those brick pit guys. And I remember them explaining this to us when we first started. They're like, okay, these drawers over here, you pull it out and it, it can't come out. It stops. It's got a stopper. So you can't pull it out. But these drawers here, if you pull too hard, that's just going to come out, right? So bear that in mind. So I've gone and I've gone to pull a, a brick from this one out here and the whole drawers come crashing down. It's taken out this drawer that's been open. So there's two drawers 
that have shattered on the ground, sending an inordinate amount of you know, thousands and thousands of bricks all over the brick pit floor. There's this footage of me just on my hands and knees sweeping the sweeping Lego. And uh, we were under pressure, right? We were just building frantically. So I've just swept it into a pile and just kind of like kicked it under, <laughs> under one of the benches. Um, but that we just, we devastated that brick pit and those poor guys, hopefully they got double time or double pay or, or uh, something like that to, to <laughs> compensate them for the mess we left behind. Yeah, far out. Um, I guess that leads kind of nicely into a question from John. Uh, how physically demanding is building such complex creations and how do your fingers and muscles cope? Yeah, it, it, look, it's, it's demanding. And, and I guess another sort of question we get, which we haven't had today, which is unusual because it's always the first question we get asked, is, you know, do you build that you know, whole thing in one day? And, and clearly it's, you can't build a 28-hour build in one day, uh, which was the finale time frame. So a lot of them are broken up. So um, you, might, you might be building over two or three days um, for a normal sort of build. But, but I tell you what, if, you know, that, that tower challenge uh, with the, the shake plate, all done in one one um, shot. So one day we, we worked late that night. They ordered us pizzas and, and we built till I think eight, eight at night. Um, that was the most demanding day, not creatively, but from a from a physical point of view. Alex and Jackson were shattered, just laying bricks down, brick after brick. Um, it, it's exhausting. And, and you're standing for a lot of the time. You're standing predominantly. Yeah. It, it, it's exhausting it's a precious situation and, and you'll be building something and you'll be like, you know, this is cool. I'm doing, I'm on the right track. I know what I'm doing. And then brick man will come and throw a spanner in the works. So you've got to, you've got to adjust your, your thinking. Maybe you've got to scrap an idea. That's really hard to do when you've got to scrap an idea, throw it away and, and start again. Um, so it is, it is demanding. It's, it's hard work, but it's also, it's also fun. And they had the, the red bulls on standby. So if there was a bit of a lull in energy, They'd come around with the lolly snakes, the Red Bulls, and, and that would perk you up and keep you going. Nice one. Um, Mark would like to know, uh, how long was the filming of the show season? So the whole season from start to finish. Yeah, a good rule of thumb, I think, uh, is it's a, it's a week of, of actual time to film one episode. So 11 episodes, 11 weeks. Um, around, around that sort of time frame. So it, it's a pretty big commitment. Like it's a two and a half to three month commitment if you make it all the way through. So it's, it's, it's a lot of time. And, and, and you can see like a lot of people, you know, you watch the show and you get to episode three and there's elimination. Like, oh, why are they so sad that that team's been eliminated? But you're spending every day together. We're going out to dinner with all the contestants and you're going to the movies, going to the art gallery on the weekends. We, we spent a lot of time together, practice building, that sort of thing. So you know, after three or four weeks, these, these are like, you know, really, really good friends that you're saying goodbye to. So it's, it, you know, the time flew and it was a, a lot of fun, but you know, it takes a long time to make television and, and the show is of a very high quality, you know, a lot of a day just to do the, um, what they call the hero shots. So, you know, filming, filming the, the fi final builds. So it's, it's things you don't think about that you don't know, have to, build it and then they put it in a room, they light it and they, they, they film it. And, and that, all that stuff takes, takes time to do. I mean, you go back and you watch it, you can see, oh, okay, yeah, that's, a, that's a shot in a nicely done studio. It's, it's, it's professionally done, but that, that stuff takes time and it adds to how long, you know, and then the interviews that you do as well, uh, where you've got you know, the green screen behind you and you, you're talking to the camera, that all has to be filmed. Um, you know, all the judging, all the, all the taking things apart, cleaning the brick pit, getting it all back together. So yeah, it, it's it's a it's a it's a time-consuming process, and, and the staff, wow, they work really hard. Production staff on that show, are absolute troopers, and they they are you know they they probably work a lot harder than we did. <laughs> yeah, wow. Um, Megan asks, what was the strangest piece of Lego that you used? Like a banana for a smile. I know I can't remember if it was you or someone else used um, surfboards for teeth. Yeah, we used we did use the surfboard. Yes, that that concept of the the MPU or the nice parts usage. Josh yeah. did the the surfboards for teeth. He also did a in the very it didn't get a lot of airplay, like I said, the episode one build whole new world. But he did this um little flying bee like alien creature with tennis rackets for the wings, which was which was kind of interesting. Um, 
the, the funniest kind of NPU that, that did make it uh, the cut was us trying to work on the diver's mouth because Brickman came up and we had the, the sort of circle mouth. So for those that don't remember, it's like a diver and he's been captured by a giant octopus and he's held upside down. And he's sort of got this horrified look on his face. And Brickman came up and he said, you know what, that mouth, it's not right. So we tried every mouth combination under the sun. You know, I was yelling at Josh, get a white hot dog and, and, a, and a red seashell. You know, we'll try that. You know, we, we tried, I reckon we were there for, for almost 40 minutes trying different mouth, just on a couple of parts, how, how you can get that to work. And we ended up going back to what we had originally. And Brickman came up to us at the end of the episode when they were all displayed and he goes, you know what? The reason that mouth was so challenging is because your character is upside down. And when it's upside down, your brain kind of tries to reverse the, the, the face a little bit. So that's why you were finding it so hard. Um, and so, yeah, but you, you, you got to try. And I think it, it made pretty good television as we were trying all these different combinations. And Brickman kept coming back and shaking his head. And, and 40 minutes later, back to square one. Yeah. Um, speaking of, of Brickman, a couple of people want to know, if um, Hamish and Brickman are on set all the time or do they just come in when they need to be filmed? Yeah. Like, yeah. So if you imagine 28 hour build, they're, they're not there the whole time. So they, they get, they've obviously got to go and have break and, and um, you know, maybe Hamish has got to prepare his lines or prepare his next joke and, and Brickman's got to, you know, do a bit of judging or, or, you know, fill out some notes or something. So they, they do come on and, and it's interesting, like, when they come around to your table. So when Brickman does a visit, well, it's a very obvious thing that that's about to happen because eight cameras suddenly appear around your desk. Um, and, and so, and your story producer pops in and, and all these sorts of things. So um, they're, they're there to do the bits they need to, um, but they, they get their downtime as well. So what, and it wasn't, you know, you couldn't just go, Hey, you, you could do it a little bit, but you couldn't just go, Hey, Brickman, come over here and, you know, help me out with this thing. And Hamish, give me a bit of advice here. It was fairly well controlled when they would come over and, and you know give their give their feedback and give their advice. Yeah, sure. Um, and I guess in that vein, uh, John would like to know what's more important: creative imagination or technical expertise? Yeah, look, this is that's a really good question. Um, what I, what I would say is that they're all important, but they were they had varying degrees of importance depending on the challenge you're doing. So if you sort of think back, you go, okay, 3D art, that's really about the creative and the aesthetic, right? And then you go, okay, tower challenge. Well, that's really about the technical. And what, what they were doing, if you actually go back and you watch every episode, they're preparing us with a toolkit or a skill set to then allow us to go into a free build for the finale and produce the best piece of work that we can. So they're saying, all right, somewhere along the line, you've worked on technical because that was important. And some, somewhere along the line, you've worked on aesthetics because that's really important. And now you're equipped with a toolkit where you can use all those things to do a final build. So um, for me, you know, like Lego is only as good as it, it will hold. So you could have the best imagination in the world, but if you can't get the structures to support itself and it's going to collapse, that's no good either. So you need a bit of both, but I think ultimately it's what it looks like. So you need to have the technique to underpin it, but ultimately you'll be judged on, on what your build does. So yeah, a bit of, a bit of everything I think answers that one. Yeah. Um, and I guess this is a production question. Cassie would like to know, were the contestants aware of whether they'd made it through or been eliminated when you did the interviews in front of the green screen? They were always trying to see if they could tell by the emotions in the interviews. Yeah, I don't know if I can I can divulge that one. Um, but uh, yeah, you, you too much of a peek behind the yeah, curtain. Yeah, it might be a bit too much of a peek behind the curtain. But um, suffice to say that I'm sure I did interviews where I didn't know what the outcome was. So you know, that, that's probably the best way to put it. Is is you generally you don't know, yeah. and then once you know, you might just film that last little bit. So. I'd say for the most part, those reactions are, you're not going to, you're not going to find out much from trying to read between the lines. Oh, he, he winked his eye a little bit. That's, that's a giveaway. I don't, I don't think it's, it's done like that. There's a tear there. He's yeah. definitely going home. <laughs> um, uh, Josh S would like to know, uh, can we see some of your MOCs? Uh, I might, 
I might. I don't know if I've got a lot of Lego in this room, actually. And and like I said, I don't actually do a lot of a lot of mocks. Um, oh, I had one floating around. Oh, yeah, I've got one. I'm just going to reach over. It's a very small one. Um, this is something I was playing around with at a small scale, a little character build that I came up with. And this was for a for an article that I had to do. You had to build something in less than 200 pieces. So I wanted to kind of convey that um, caricature style, but in something small scale. So yeah, that's a little little sort of happy dog that I put together. And, and using those techniques, a lot of the um, the snot techniques and, and um, you know, trying to get the, the angles right and, and a few strange angles. So like, you know, the head's not, you know, perfectly straight, can be tilted and that sort of thing. Oh. Um, so just, just little techniques like that. Cute. Um, Sebastian asks, did your wife and kids uh, come and visit you or did you go the whole three months without them? Uh, they didn't come over to visit. I did get to fly back to Adelaide for a few weekends. I think there was, there was a Melbourne Cup weekend that we had to uh, shut down production for, for, for the five days. So we flew back for that one. Um, but it was, yeah, we were, we were away from home a fair bit. And, and you can imagine those Perth boys, Jackson and Alex, that's a big trip and a big time difference. So I think even they might have not even chosen to fly home when they had the opportunity. Yeah. Adelaide to Melbourne is really easy. So that, that you can just fly in and zip back. But um, yeah, it, it's, it, it's, it's tough, obviously, being away from family. And for anyone who's interested in sort of auditioning, yeah, bear that in mind. Like I said, you know, potentially three months away, um, but you do meet so many people. Like I, I was never, I never felt lonely or I never felt like I didn't have someone there um, to hang out with. So that, that was really cool. Nice. Um, I kind of feel like we should segue a little bit into uh, toy collecting uh, from here. So like when, when did you get started in toy collecting? Yeah. So as you can see behind me, you know, and probably from, from Lego masters did a, did a little shoot here in the, in the toy collection room. Um, I sort of got into it. It was it was a late '90s, and being a massive so everyone knows I'm a massive Star Wars fan. And I grew up, and I've got a few here. Like grew up on you know these things, these Kenner Star Wars figures. Like yeah. these were you know oh how good were these you know and and they might look simple by today's standards, but these were so so popular. Um and, and so we you know we had a good handful of these Star Wars characters um, by Kenner. Had an older brother, so we you know we play together. And then I was walking through, I think I was into video games and I'd go, I'd go to the, I think sometimes the video game section was in the toy section. So I'd go and check out the video games. And, and one day I was walking through uh, a store here, it's no longer here called John Martin's here in Adelaide. And there was a, um, these, these Star Wars toys back on the, on the pegs, these Kenner Star Wars toys. And they coincided with the special editions of the films that they put out. So I think it was around 96, 97. And I'm like, oh, Star Wars toys, how cool is that? And I, and I thought, I, I'm too old to buy toys. I can't buy, I can't buy action figures. I'm, I'm you know, 16. It's, a, it's just weird. Um, so I, I got them for my brother for Christmas. I'm like, here, look, you know, that, that's cool. You know, like we used to get these toys for Christmas. Here are some, some Star Wars toys for you. And that kind of got me going, oh, I wonder what else there is. And like, you know, oh, there's a Boba Fett. I might get that. And so I, that, that got me into kind of, modern toys and then that sparked okay what are the toys that i had or i didn't have as a kid that i always wanted to have and i'd go into these markets and these secondhand stores and be like oh that's cool and so it kind of went from there and and um you know collecting old lines that i kind of missed out on as a kid but then also keeping a finger on the pulse of what the new toys that were hitting the, the shelves were and if you look at the it was fascinating now 2020 if you look at the toys that are on the shelves, they're all the properties that I kind of grew up with, like 80s properties like Transformers and Star Wars and Ninja Turtles. They're all the things that, that were kind of the toys that I love. So you can kind of get, you can kind of just keep, keep collecting. You know, all the stuff you love from your childhood is still on the toy shelves. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's one of these things. And, and, and there, were, there weren't a lot of regulations back in the 80s about what they could promote to kids. So we got brainwashed by the marketing executives. So I, I, put, I blame them to some degree for this compulsion of, of having to, you know, like the box says, collect them all. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, yeah it, it's funny. I found a, um, a Raphael. So Ninja Turtles, Raphael, but dressed up as the wrestler sting. And yep. that was like the ultimate like piece of yeah. 
Yeah. For me, it, like two of the, these things that I, I loved when I was a kid smashed together in one toy. And you know what? I did want to collect them all. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's hard not to. We've been yeah. programmed. <laughs> Um, John wants to know, um, what's your favorite uh, toy figurine in your private collection? And do you buy two of each, one to keep and one to play with? Maybe buy one for the kids, one for yourself? Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Um, I've, got, so I've got too many favorites. It's like, um, it's like, you know, saying a favorite child or something. But one that I've got here, actually, this is a really interesting toy because um, it's, it's shredded. Speaking of Ninja Turtles, it's Shredder. Yeah from um, the Fred Wolf cartoon, which was what really launched Ninja Turtles back in the, in the late 80s, early 90s onto the big screen. But Turtles originally started as a comic book, uh, yeah. an independent, very, quite dark and gritty comic book. And they, they made it friendly for kids and, and that sort of thing. But the first Shredder toy we ever got looked nothing like the Shredder from the cartoon. And it took, I reckon, a good 35 years, 30 years perhaps, to get, to get a cartoon accurate toy of the Shredder. So that's something that's very special for me because I waited so long to, to kind of get it. Um, to the question of buying multiples, it's a very slippery slope. Um, and particularly if you're buying them for the kids as well, there are a couple of toy lines that I've collected that I go, okay, that's just super, super special to me. I'll buy yeah. two so I can open one and keep one in the original packaging. Because predominantly I like to keep, if I buy a toy, I like to keep it in the original packaging because to me that's part of the the collecting experience um it, it's it's that i'm in the minority bear that in mind a lot of toy collectors love to open and, and good on them because it is a you know they go well what's the point of having it in the box and and there is some truth to that so where, where it's a line i love i will buy two um but yeah that can get very expensive very quickly yeah and um, do you do you prefer new toys or like op shop toys or garage sale toys like second hand? Yeah. Like, what do you prefer? like oh, do you look, want pristine in the box or do you do you mind if it's a bit sort of? No, rich? look, look. Um, I, I'm happy to get you know like an old you know, you know two dollar bargain bin superpowers figure, um, scratched up. That that's cool. You know, find something like that in a little box for fifty cents or two dollars is is really cool. Um, so, so I love that. I love that part of um, exploring and, and finding things. That's part of being a collector is the excitement of what are you going to find in the box of, of what you know, they think is of, of as junk. Um, what's really interesting now is I sort of wax and wane between modern toys and, and vintage toys because we're living in this sort of nostalgic era where a lot of properties get rebooted. Like I said, you know, you can go out and buy a beautiful Transformers toy that looks just like Optimus Prime did in the, you know, 80, 84 cartoon. And it's engineering of 2020 standards. So there's something in that modern toy where they, they bring back something very nostalgic that, that I love. But I, I, I just, I don't know if you can ever beat that experience of this is the toy that I grew up with, or this is the toy that I played with, you know, for hours and hours and as a child. Um, and I think for that for that reason, those childhood toys will always be my favourite. Yeah, cool. Um, Megan asks, uh, "Is your wife okay with the toy collecting? And uh, do you have a shed out the back, or, or are you limited just to this one room that we see you sitting?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, very good question. I, I have to answer this as diplomatically as I can. Um, <laughs> so she's not a <laughs> she's not a toy collector. Um, but, but luckily I've been, uh, we, we met at high school. So we met actually at a similar time as I started the toy collecting. So she's, she's always known it's been a passion of mine and something I'm interested in. And so she's very, she's a very understanding person. She knows that it, um, brings me a lot of enjoyment. And for that reason, she kind of supports it. Having said that, we did have a rule when we got married and that was, you got one room and everything needs to stay in that room. And I've been a bit naughty because actually when they, when they filmed the backstory for Lego Masters, I've got my toy room, but I really didn't have my Lego on display. So I, I commandeered the lounge room and I said, look, hey, um, Leanne, for filming, they really want to film some Lego. Can I, can I take that room and just put Lego in there? And I, and I haven't taken it out. So <laughs> I've managed to get, so I've, I've sort of bent the rules a little bit. So I'm, I'm skating on maybe some thin ice, but look, I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky to have someone who kind of like understands it because it, it can be a bit like, you know, it's, it's a house and it, you know, this looks like a shop, right? Yeah. So that, you know, it's not, that's not for everyone to have in, in their house. So no, she's, she's wonderful to let me 
uh, embrace my passion. Yeah. Um, and Vivan and Avan uh, would like to know, uh, what do you do with the toys? So are you keeping them on display? Are you like, what do you, what do, you do? How do you? Yeah. Well, yeah, look, it's, it's great. Great question. I, at, at the moment, you know, they're, they're, they're displayed for the most part. And I'll come in here like, you know, I've got a rule with transformers. I open all my transformers because they're there to be transformed, right? So I open them up yeah. and, and transform. Them. That's so where I'll come in sometimes and, and tinker and, and, you know, move things around, take some photos and do some posts and that sort of thing. What I'd love to do, like it's, it's a, it's a dream of mine is to make this on display for everyone. So like just put it in a big museum and, and let everyone come through and relive their childhood and get those same, you know, they don't have to be crazy and collect it all. But just to come in for, for two hours and go, oh, you know what? I had that and bring back those memories because that's a big part of what we do for the podcast is, you know, to, to connect with that sense of childhood, those memories, that nostalgia that, that means a lot to a lot of people, particularly those of us that were brainwashed in, in the 80s. Um, so that, that's my dream. But financially, I have to kind of work that through because it's, it's an expensive venture to set up a, a museum. So hopefully one day the stars align and I can, I can get all of this out of my house and, and into a, a public space. Um, and on the podcast, you know, how, how much of your toy collecting now is for the love of the toys and how much has become professional development or uh, content creation, you know, for the podcast? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because I mean, toy collecting has got, had a, a pretty big resurgence. Like when I started, it was a, a thing you didn't want to talk about. Like it was uncool and, and, you know, whereas I think, this, my generation now is in that, that I mean, I'm kind of, I love this stuff. I grew up with it and I'm proud to do it. Um, so uh, there are a lot of YouTubers. There are a lot of, you know, professionals that do make a living out of, you know, podcasts or reviews or YouTube. Unfortunately here in, in Adelaide, for Toy Power, we do punch above our weight in terms of the, the global scale of, of toy related properties. So we, we do pretty well for an, for an Aussie podcast. But unfortunately, we're away from the US, which is the center of, of the pop culture. Yeah. And, and therefore, we just don't have the opportunity to get to the conventions and, and do the interviews in person with the industry professionals that those YouTubers get to do. So we, we managed to pull in a few of those guests from time to time on the podcast. But it's just, it's, it's still for us, it's more of the, the love of the toys rather than anything that, that is a professional undertaking. And, and I'm quite happy for it to be like that. Um, because I think it might lose some of the enjoyment if it becomes your, your, your nine to five work. Um, so I can just, you know, we, we do the show, we've got our, our followers that, that are very vocal, like, you know, like today's been great, like all the questions that we've had. We've got a lot of our, our Patreons who are sort of volunteer their hard earned, you know, a couple of dollars a, a month to support the show and help us buy new equipment, that sort of thing. And, the, and we've created a wonderful community where we get a lot, get a lot of feedback and a lot of positivity. Um, which is wonderful. So that, that to me is worth more than kind of, you know, all the money in the world is, is, is that, that feedback and that engagement from, from the fans that we're, we're reaching and, and they enjoy the show enough to kind of um, become part of it and, and sort of contribute to it, which is lovely. Where did the idea for Toy Power Podcast come from? Yeah, it's, it, was, it was funny. So I've got a, a mate, uh, Darren, who's, who's another member of Toy Power. And we've been mates. Um, we met actually on a, like a He-Man fan forum back in the early 2000s and pretty much been best friends ever since. And um, he came to me one day and said, oh, look, I'd, I'd love to do a podcast. And I thought, well, why do you want to do a podcast? That, that's ridiculous. I'm not, I'm not going to do a podcast. That seems like a bit of a waste of time. And to be fair, who hasn't had a mate that has said, <laughs> yeah. what should do a podcast? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a common occurrence. I, I'm sure everyone can kind of tick that box. And I reckon my, from, that, from that time when he pitched it to, to now, or to when we started doing it four years ago, my kind of focus on toy collecting shifted. So it shifted from, oh, I've just got to buy all this stuff, to um, actually there's a community out there. And what's probably more important is accumulating toys, is engaging with the community and sharing, sharing the passion, sharing the stories, talking about the things. So more than just the physical objects, more about the, the community. So my shifting had changed and, and I went back to him, I think about two, two years, it took two years to kind of get to that place. And I said, Hey, are you still, still interested in doing that podcast? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'd love to do it. And um, we're like, cool. Okay, let, let's do it. And, and, and interestingly, um, we, we thought we, maybe we want one more person. So we reached out to a, a friend, Ben, who we'd met just recently 
um, at some of the swap meets. And, and I, I, I felt like, you know, like you, everyone asked you, let's do a podcast. You're like, nah, I don't want to do it. And I, I was sure he was going to be like, nah, nah, just nah, not interested. He responded like, yes. Oh, that'd be so cool. Can't wait. Uh, smiley faces, everything. So like, cool. We've got this. Um, within a week, we, we'd set up the first episode. We're ready to record. And Ben gets a message from, from his mate, Frank, going, hey, I'm thinking of starting up a podcast. Do you want to join it? And so he said, oh, look, we're literally about to record. Come on to our podcast. So we, so we got Frank. So that, that's the story of how Toy Power came together. And, um, and we would catch up. We, we record two episodes um, every fortnight. So we meet once a fortnight or in COVID, you know, Skype, Skype in. Um, and, and we barely miss it because we have so much fun doing it. You know, it takes, it takes like a wedding or, a, or an overseas trip or a surgery to, for one of us kind of not to, to do an episode. Um, yeah. So it's, it's just such a, a fun a fun get together. We, we, we love it. Awesome. Um, like something about, you know, having, uh, you and three other guys, you know, in conversation on a podcast sounds amazingly fun, but it also sounds like it could get real confusing and real loud real quick. Like how, how difficult is it? And, and yeah, how do you manage, manage it, especially during a pandemic? Yeah, oh, we we because we traditionally get in the same room. It's uh, you, you follow the body cues and body language. So yeah, and we're pretty uh, we're pretty structured actually. Like you know, that's probably the the accountant in me. We we like to have a good run sheet, and um, if we've got if we've got a guest coming on, we obviously prepare the questions and send it to the to the guest, and and you know, so so it, it's structured. So we don't we don't have that overlapping, um, and I think that's been a big part of our success. But you don't want it to be too staged at the same time you want it to be the free conversational um style as well and actually when darren pitched it, he said oh, what i want this to be is like you know four mates have gone into a pub and they're just chatting about things they're passionate about and and we've had funnily enough we've had that feedback from listeners that say oh, i just feel like i'm in the room you know with you, you guys are just sort of talking and i'm just there on the bar still sitting and listening and and that's wonderful to kind of hear that because we capture you know the structure gives us a professional our product, but we still manage to keep that fun conversational element. So I think it is, if, if you are out there thinking about podcasting, I think it's, it's good to kind of think about both, you know, be structured. We, we have this rule that, you know, we're an hour podcast. We, we do an hour and, and that's it. And we listen to all sorts of podcasts and some go for, you know, three hours because they waffle on and that's great because that's their thing. But um, we've chosen to be kind of, you know, a bit more on the, on the structured side. Nice one. Um, and you've recently finished writing a book. Tell us about, tell us about the book. How did, how did that all start? What, what's yeah. The... You, okay. So for those of you that have been paying attention, I'm an accountant and I have a, a background in, in art, studied art, love art, uh, love music, love all these creative pursuits. And I think one day at work, I'm just like, Oh, you know, I've got a really good job and I love my work, but it, it's not fulfilling the creative side. And so I sat down and I brainstormed and I was doing the podcast. So that was kind of an outlet, but I thought, what can I do? That's a creative outlet in my spare time. And I went through the list of sculpting, painting, writing, all that music, whatever. And writing came out with, with a young family as the most convenient thing to do. Cause I could, you know, load up my laptop, do a bit of writing and, and, and turn it off and no mess, no paints to clean up that sort of thing. So I started, started writing a book and, the genesis of that book, funnily enough, was sort of the 80s properties, like, you know, the Masters of the Universe, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, those sort of stories and that imagination and bringing that kind of nostalgic love that I had for those cartoons to life in a, in a story. But it, it quickly changed into something else, um, a bit more adult because I'm an adult and, and not, you know, like a bit more, it's not, it's not a, a kid's book, so it's not aimed at, at, at sort of eight-year-olds. But it is, it is a fantasy very much in the, in the vein of uh, Lord of the Rings and, and it brings in sort of Star Wars elements and, and those sorts of things, things I'm passionate about. But also it's an opportunity to, you know, I find sometimes as consumers of, of media or consumers of, of movies and we can, we can be critical. You know, Star Wars fans probably have, a, uh, have, have had some bad moments where we've, we've really criticised what's been produced. And, and part of me, you know, like I, I don't necessarily agree with what they did with the, um, the new trilogy, you know, episode seven, eight, nine. It wasn't, 
my vision of, of how Luke would be. And that's, that's really hard for Disney to do that because what is the vision? You know, I've got a different vision to, to, to you and, and everyone's got, you know, a different vision of what might have happened to Luke. And it's really hard to, to do something that kind of meets, you know, we've been thinking about these things for, for 30 years. It's really hard. But, but instead of kind of complaining about it, I thought, well, what would I do? Or how would I tell a story? Or how would I solve those issues that I have with, with the movies that I'm seeing? How would I treat those characters? What would I make them do? And, and George R. R. Martin was, was a big influence. Gene Wolfe as well, Book of the New Sun, who I absolutely love, my favourite author. Um, but things that are, you know, you look, at, you look at the way Martin writes, and Game of Thrones is hugely popular, and popular because, you know, spoilers, but Eddard Stark, who you think is the main character, gets, gets killed off. Um, very quickly. And, and so he, he changed the rules to some degree. But when you go back and you read Martin and you read things like the Red Wedding and how that transpires, all the pieces fit. All the, the pieces are there for the astute reader that, oh, yep, I can see why that Red Wedding happened. I can see the, the things that the characters did to bring that action from the other characters and it all fits together and makes sense. So that, that's been a big driver for me in writing these stories is that how do you how do you make sure your characters are, are true and they, they react in a way that's believable for the audience um, and, and it's hard, right? So like having now been in the creative seat and just finally finished the book, making that work, making it exciting, being riveting enough, but realistic enough, it's, it's a fine line that I've had to tread, but it's been, it's been really rewarding. It's been really good to then, you know, have that lens and look at the way filmmakers and creators kind of apply that. And, and there are some, extremely talented people out there that do it, do it really well. Yeah. So when, when can we expect to be reading this? Uh, well, it's, it's done. I mean, that's the good news is I've actually finished it. I've actually written book two. It's a part of a trilogy. Um, and essentially it follows, uh, it might sound plagiarized, but um, it essentially follows a quest to find a, a chosen one. Um, and and the, the first book is that quest. So it's set in a, a medieval world where we've got these paladins that are assigned um, to a specific order that, are, that bring this chosen one back into the world, essentially. And so book one is all about their quest to, to find that, that person. And so there, there is a, a trilogy. So there is a, a second book, which might be a bit of, bit of spoilers if I t talk too much about what happens there. But um, it, it's finished. I've got uh, my editor kind of going through it at the moment and he's, he, I think he's got about 20 or 30 pages left to go. Um, and then I'll incorporate those changes and then it's basically off to writer's essay for a manuscript review um, from, from one of their guys. And then hopefully it's in a state that is publishable. That's sort of the, the big question as a first time publisher, is it, is it you know, can it, can it be published? Yeah. If the answer to that is no, I think I like I've put enough effort in that I'd probably go down the self-publishing route. Um, so hopefully, you know, within the next three to six months, it'll be, you know, out there. Um, hopefully under an actual publishing house, but worst case under under Trent Books. <laughs> Excellent. Well, you know, you know where to to call if you need a venue for a book launch. Ah, oh, done. <laughs> Love it, and hopefully it can be done in person. Yeah, assuming we're not still living through a pandemic. <laughs> yep. um, oh, Vivan and Avan have asked, what's the name of the book? Uh, so the, the series is called The Dark Epoch and book one is The Quest for the Light Seeker. So yeah, it's, it's about, there, there is a dark threat that looms as, as sometimes in all these, these stories, an evil threat. Actually, it's quite, it's quite mysterious. It sort of lurks in shadow and, and for most of the book, you don't know where it is or where it's coming from, um, but but essentially there's this threat that the world will enter a dark epoch, and and the knights, by hopefully finding the light seeker who is their herald to the world, will avert the dark epoch and the dark lord Morgoth from returning. But will, will they, or or is is it all part of his plan? And that's that's some of the the conflict that goes on uh, in the story. It's it's I'm a huge fan. I can't wait for the movie Tenant to come out by Christopher Nolan massive fan of Christopher Nolan, the way he gets you to think one thing, but, you know, might uh, just be giving you the, the sort of the wrong information and, and, you know, something's going on over here. Uh, some of his twists, I know M. Night Shyamalan is a big name for twists, Sixth Sense, that sort of thing. Went off the boil a little bit, in my opinion, with some of, some of his writing, but um, 
Nolan does it well every time, right? You, you look at the prestige, it's absolutely brilliant. Uh, Inception, all those sorts of works. So I can't wait for Tenant. Um, but I, I bring in, I think, uh, hopefully I bring in a bit of the David, uh, the Christopher Nolan um, style of, of storytelling. And I'm also a big fan of David Lynch, uh, Twin Peaks fame. Um, okay. for, for that, for that, that just that off center weirdness. Um, I love that. And, and, and Lost, J.J. Abrams and his um, Lost franchise. My, my rule going into the book was every chapter has to end on a cliffhanger. So every chapter has to pose a question, pose a cliffhanger. It's hard, hard, pretty hard to do consistently, but it was my, I don't know if I've done it, um, but that was my goal as well. So it's sort of, yeah, I've, I've got a lot of those influences. I, I love, I love media. I love stories. So hopefully it's, um, it's something people want to read. Yeah, fantastic. I'm I'm looking forward to it already. I'm uh, hopefully, yeah, we can we can talk about it in person eventually. Well, Trent, it has been great to chat with you tonight. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, where where can people find you online? Yeah, I think well, the good thing about me is there's only one Trent Cookerelli in the world. So um, you Google that and you get, you get everything um, from Lego you Masters. You can spell it correctly. Yeah, if you, if you can spell it correctly. Yeah, that's right. Um, but yeah, the, the podcast we do is Toy Power Podcast. It's all ages appropriate, although the younger audience might find it a bit boring and maybe even those that aren't, aren't obsessed like we are. But, but um, that's one place to find us. Um, and then, yeah, I guess hopefully when, when the book sort of gets a bit closer, I'll, I'll have a website there that, that you can check out and, maybe a bit of artwork and, and um, some analysis of some of the ph- philosophical themes that arise in the show. Cause it's, 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 you know, in the book, because it's all about, I think a big part for me and, and watching lost and that, that experience was the sort of the debate, you know, an episode would end and then it's all about the debate of, okay, what does that mean? Or what, what was happening there? What, what, you know, I saw this, but could it mean that? Um, I'd love to sort of, have that debate um and, and I, I love giving it to, to to beta readers to have a look at so i can have those conversations and, and sort of see if they saw some of the the things that i've hidden in there see if they if they could see it coming so hopefully eventually we'll be able to meet on a forum and, and maybe chat it through yeah fantastic well look thank you again trent thank you so much for your time um thank you to everyone who's tuned into the webinar i hope you've enjoyed our chat with uh, with trent cuccarelli Uh, You can find Burnside Library on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, all at Burnside Library, uh, and sign up to our newsletter at www.burnside.sa.gov.au forward slash library to stay uh, up to date on all of our upcoming events. So thank you again for tuning in. Hope to see you again for more at Burnside Library. Thanks again, Trent. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.